Thank you so much, Janelle um, and Julia, for having me here. Well, um, so as Janelle mentioned, um, I'm Arushi Garg. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in the Netherlands at Radboud University uh, at the Donders Center. And I'm also a student in the Max Planck Research uh, School, which is the graduate school um, at Max Planck. Um, but I have a software background um, which is where all of this comes in. Um, and I'll get into the details of that in a, in a minute. I okay. So um, once again, hello. As I mentioned, I'm Arushi Garg. Um, and if you would like to uh, take this presentation, take notes within the presentation, you can actually download it from my website. Um, a previous version of the presentation is available. Uh, and my website is mentioned on the screen that you see here, uh, www.arushigat.com. And if you go to resources, and I think there's something under resources called our programming resources, and there you can find the presentation. So you can um, download the presentation. In the meanwhile, while I go through the first slides where there wouldn't be much of significance except my introduction. Um, yeah, and if you want to reach out to me afterwards, um, you can reach me on my personal email shown here um, or through Twitter, um, LinkedIn, usual channels. Okay, so, so first of all, I want to start out with setting some expectations. Um, this presentation is primarily aimed at academics, uh, students, or those who are starting out to code. If any of you has programmed before or has had a more formal way of in like for formal introduction to programming, some kind of formal uh, course in programming, um, or have indulged in industry um, working in software in the industry or package development uh, with R, it might be that many of the major points that we cover here are already known to you. And thus this, some parts of the presentation at least might seem redundant. So keep that in mind. Uh, the major focus here is going to be on quick things, quick, simple things that we can do to drastically change the way the code looks um, and to you know, improve its use, not only for ourselves, but also for sharing with others. Um, the primary aim is to improve the readability of the code here. Um, and with that improved readability, all of these other things become possible, um, but this is not meant to teach you how to code better. Although I think that improved readability would lead you to code better. Um, our particular, this is like uh, the perspective that we are taking is particularly our studio, um, even within R. Um, and some of these principles can transfer to other languages and other environments. But some of the tips that I give here might need to be modified to suit um, other environments than R studio and other languages like Python, Java, or so on. Um, I have used examples from scripts that were sent to me by others, um, not this time around, but before. Um, so just so, you know, it, it, these are not made up examples. These are ways that people code. And you might see resemblance of something that you code like in these examples. Um, if that happens, this is not meant um, as an offense. It, you know, it, 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 we, we, all, we all learn and improve. There's, there's no wrong or right. And this is, this is just a suggestive way that we are doing it. And so I'll be showing examples of good ways and not so good ways of doing things. So I invite you here, first of all, to open up a piece of your own code, if that is possible for you right now. And look at that code as we go through this presentation, through this document. Um, and try to see if the things that I talk about, if you notice some of those things in your own code, and that'll give you very immediate ideas in how you can instantly improve your code and make it more readable. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, yeah, sorry, this is meant for my website, but for, for the sake of our presentation, if you have any questions, um, just raise your hand. You can, I actually would be open if the moderator is fine with it, if somebody also unmutes themselves directly and asks the question, I'm completely fine being interrupted. 
Okay, so my background, uh, as mentioned before, I'm a PhD candidate at the Donders Institute at Radboud University uh, in Nijmegen, Netherlands. Um, before that, I did a master's in cognitive science with psychology and neuroscience as my majors. Um, but before that, in another life in India, I was a software developer. Um, and I worked in a company called Accenture and I worked um, with a technology called SAP. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you might have used it even. Um, and this is, it's, it's a, SAP is a software in itself. It has its own programming language. Um, and whatever I learned about, uh, about code readability and quality um, control in terms of software, I learned in the context of SAP. So a lot of the things that I'll be showing you here are also things that I have picked up from a very different environment and applied to R. So it's not things that I have read online about R specifically, but I've tried to kind of modify my own practice in R according to what I learned in, in another environment. Um, so what, like I have this background. Why, why does this mean that I need to give this presentation? So, it's because when I first entered academia and I saw how things were being coded, I was really shocked coming from industry because Accenture was this place where we had multiple level of levels of reviews um, for like even one line of code. So we would do a self review, then we'd have a team review, then we'd have an inter team review, then we'd have a testing team review. That there'd be multiple levels of reviews and tests for the code to make sure that it works. And at every level, like numerous bugs were found and fixed. And so I was really shocked that here, no review was going on. We were not even doing self reviews. There were no checklists available to see if, you know, all of the variables were assigned or reassigned correctly. And it scared me to think that science was being um, like it, it, it was being sort of, it, it was progressing th through this technique because that means that maybe some of the papers that we are putting out, the results that we see are results of buggy codes. They might not be as reliable. And it's, it's basically that kind of fear that made me push for more higher readability because when you have better readability, you will spot bugs in your code more easily. You will make less mistakes in your code. Um, and then you, you will feel more confident sharing your code in public. It promotes open science, the works. So it's, it's a really uh, sort of beneficial way of um, thinking about programming in the first place and not treating it as something that you need to get done to move on to the next stage. It, I think if, I don't know how many of you are scientists, but I think it makes you a better, more reliable scientist to improve, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you improve your code's readability. So in the software industry, uh, coding practices depend on the company or the standards of the particular project that you're working on. And that includes how the code is formatted, uh, specific kinds of indentation, different companies and different projects have different uh, uh, requirements with regards to even indentation, when indentation takes place, when it doesn't take place, with regards to naming conventions, modularity con conventions, what gets converted into a function, what gets converted into an object, um, and when does that happen? Uh, in terms of version control, people are varied in their approaches. Uh, in terms of how thorough the documentation is, what kind of documentation steps are being followed, technical specifications or functional, spe uh, functional specifications. In terms of self-reviews, self-tests, peer reviews, etc. And there's, as I mentioned, rigorous testing at different levels. However, in academia, none of these coding practices exist. There are now, I think, more and more labs that have um, a sort of standard operating procedure when it comes to codes um, so that, you know, to be able to share code at least within lab mates. But it is, the number is scary, scary low. I actually don't know. I think I maybe know one lab here that has some practices that everybody tries to follow. And even those are not strictly enforced. However, scientists often say, well, they're doing fine without any standards, right? But are we really, as, as I mentioned before, like, is your code really that reliable? Um, and then the counterpoint is, well, the needs of the software industry are not the needs of academia. 
So industry works in a different landscape. There are larger teams. Um, science is not carried out in large teams. It's often singular projects that PhDs and postdocs are carrying out um, or even master students. Um, in industry, you might be working on a piece of code today that somebody else picks up tomorrow. During the testing phase, a completely different team might work on fixing the bugs. During maintenance and support, another company altogether might take care of that. And so all of that doesn't happen in academia. So I'm kind of playing the devil's advocate here like and saying, well, why, why do we need this, right? In, in industry, there's a different aim. Software is the product that you sell or a service that you offer. And so if it is broken, the customer would leave, your profits would vanish. And the product needs to be used in many different situations in many different scenarios. So it needs to be tested for all of those scenarios. In science, however, you often only use a piece of code once for running your analysis and then it's done and you, then you move on to the next project and you create an entirely different piece. However, academia does have some needs and these are the needs of academia. So we need to make sure first our results are reliable or in other words, well, I hope I don't have to retract my paper because of this bug in my code. Um, we need to make sure that our science is reproducible. And for that, we need to make sure that our results are reproducible and our results are dependent on that piece of code. And so if our code gives us different outputs every time we run it, our re reproducibility takes a hit. Um, we also want to be efficient at coding. We want to be able to share our scripts um, with other people who might find them useful, but also in the, uh, in the interest of being open and transparent. So open science. Um, then we all always often come across this thing of like, wait a minute, what does this code really do? Or what is this specific section in my code doing? Why have I, why have I multiplied this variable by two and not four where it should have been four? all of these kinds of questions. We actually have even more needs. Um, we often save our files as study one analysis, study one analysis final, study one analysis adjusted, study one analysis final final. This time it's really final. Those versions and you don't know which version was the correct version in the end, which version was the one that you used. Um, I don't understand the logic I used behind this code block as I, as I mentioned before. Also error resolution and debugging becomes quite a hassle. Uh, sometimes you kind of expect you will see something and you think you should be seeing it, but you don't see it. And it's really hard to go back and find where was that point in your code where all of this is falling apart. Um, reusability. So if your code is highly readable, you can actually make it, re you can actually reuse components of it and not have to spend time programming the same thing over and over again for different analyses. Uniformity and consistency, so that if, if you start implementing a proper way of saying, having naming conventions, that you always name um, variables in a particular way, while function names are named in a different way, you create your own style and it will become easier for you to see your codes from last years and understand what is going on where, because you're more familiar with how you code. Automatization. So there are things that um, we do for analyses that sometimes are also helpful outside of the context of analyses, like picking up a bunch of files from a particular folder and putting them somewhere else. And um, there might be a completely different scenario, maybe unrelated to your scientific career where you need to pick up a bunch of files from a folder and transfer them. If you have a piece of code available that you've logged somewhere, you could actually just change, take that up, change the folder name that you're using, change the file name that you pick up and do that manually on your personal laptop. So you kind of automatize the process that you would do manually, maybe not for an analysis, but for some other use. Um, and it would save you a lot of time. But you'd, uh, you'd not be able to do that if your code wasn't readable. So, um, so the, the point is that even though software uh, industry has a good motivation for you know being as thorough as they are. We also have an immense amount of motivation, a large number of reasons why it makes sense for us to make our code readable. Um, but 
the needs of the software you're using are also really important to take into account. So things that would make R more readable are not the same things that would make Java more readable. So there are differences in how different language, you know, how, how you modify some things according to different languages. For instance, in Java, um, you need to declare variables before you can use them. In R, you can just start typing a statement, say variable one, and assign it something. But in, but in other languages, that's not the case. And so different conventions need applied. Um, in, in languages that I've used, um, even in ABAP, which is the, you see ABAP here, which is the lang programming language used in SAP, um, variables and constants were different. So there would be constants whose values wouldn't change throughout the code. And there'd be variables whose values could change. So these kinds of differences arise and they require a different approach. Um, so things that I'm saying today, as I mentioned before, uh, cover the needs of R, but don't and might not cover the needs of other programming languages. Our focus is in R and R Studio. And similar principles might apply to Python. Python is very close, but it's still not the same. But other languages and software might differ radically. Okay, so that was an introduction, perhaps a little too long, but it's good to kind of set stage um, before we progress further because um, more questions can arise afterwards otherwise. Right, so what can we do to make our code more readable? Well, let's begin with the, the simpler, faster changes. Stop clearing the workspace. So I think many of you will be all too familiar with this particular command. Um, you probably might even have been recommended to use this command at the beginning of your code um, because it is important to clear your environment, otherwise your analysis actually might look very different. It's definitely a good idea to start with a clean environment, and I would suggest never to save your workspace environment. You know, when you kind of close R and ask you, do you want to space, uh, save this workspace image? Never save that. Um, Always good to start with a clean environment, but there are better ways of doing that than using this statement. So instead of using this statement, what I would recommend using is the RStudio project functionality. Um, and that is not sufficient. You need to use the RStudio project functionality and then open that project in a new session so that you always start with a blank workspace. Why? Um, I have presented this before and people have come back at me and said, no, this is ridiculous. This is, this is an insane idea. I need to use this because I don't feel safe otherwise, right? How can, how can someone recommend running a script in workspace that's not empty, but that's not what I'm recommending. Your workspace environment absolutely needs to be empty. You just have to get to it in a different way. So let me show you what happens when you run a script with this command at the beginning. Right, let's say I'm working on a project. It's complicated. It has many bells and whistles, many pieces. And my environment looks something like this. So this is the window that's usually on the top right um, in, in your RStudio workspace. And you see all of the variables listed here. I take a break. I go out for lunch or something urgent comes up and my workspace is left like this. In the meanwhile, a colleague or a friend of mine shares a script with me that I'd been waiting for. I'd, I'd been waiting on uh, for them to send me the script um, because it helps me solve an issue that I've been facing and perhaps something else. Um, I get really excited because I'm finally going to be able to cross the hump that I've been stuck at. And um, I run the script and this script looks like this, right? And there's this dreaded command at the top and I run it what happens is that I lose all of that, all of that data that was available in my workspace and my environment is completely left empty. And maybe I hadn't saved some of that data, right? So all my precious variables, values, data frames, all kinds of progress that I'd made is lost because of that one particular line. And I didn't realize that that line was in there because it might have been further down in the program after all of the library declarations, for instance. Right, so this person sending me this code combined with my error of ignoring the fact that I had all of these variables in my environment 
meant that I lost all of that progress that I'd made. So instead, if you used RStudio's project functionality, this is how it would go. Um, you make a new project. You open a new, so you, I, I can either use a new directory for that or use an existing folder where your scripts are stored. Um, you, you will see that you have the script, which is the .r file here and the data, which is a txt file containing um, details about my data, all in the same folder. So everything's in this, stored in the same folder. It's easily shareable. I think I've missed something. I'll, I'll, I'll continue and I'll come back to it if I've missed something. Um, it makes it easily shareable. It allows sharing and linking of the data and code simultaneously. And you use a hair package. Um, if any of you are not familiar about this uh, package, what this uh, package does, I can go into details, but basically what it does is, you, so first of all, you declare it like that and you call it like that. And then what it does is it looks for this R project file and it says, uh, it picks up the folder name in which this project file is saved. So that it always points to the, um, the top level of a project folder. And once you have that, you can actually pick up whatever data files you have that directly using here. And you don't have to use a fixed working directory for it. So that when you share your code with somebody else, you don't need to switch contexts. You don't need to reprogram paths in that script. If that makes it clear, if, if, it, if it doesn't, um, I think we'll, we'll look into more details uh, in a bit. Um, I, I would like it if you can take more details, please. Sure, yeah, I'll do that. So there's another thing that you can use similarly, it's called get working directory. It is a similar thing that it, it returns different results depending on what file type you're calling it from. And so it's not as safe as using the pure package. Um, yeah, as I've mentioned. So let me show you now what happens when you use the RStudio project functionality instead of clearing the workspace. So we've seen this example of you know, me use, losing all of my um, variables. Um, however, now, now we'll go through the same scenario again in a different manner. So same scenario, I have same, you know, it's similar variables available. Um, colleague sends me a code, blah, blah, blah. And this time my colleague sends me a project. Right? So he doesn't only share the script with me, but he shares, then you share the whole project with somebody. So I open that project using RStudio. And as soon as I do that, R asks me if I want to save this workspace image. So at this point, first of all, I'm uh, kind of prompted by RStudio to think about, well, you have these variables in your workspace, which I wasn't prompted in the other case. I could have just opened that file and and run and, and run it. So first of all, I'm prompted here. Now I have this option of deciding whether I do want to save this workspace image or not, right? Or I make sure that I um, save what I need from the workspace image into a separate file maybe so that I can come back to it. Or I can also choose to save the workspace image. But in that case, when you're coming back to the file that you were using before, you need to make sure that you were in the correct state and running the correct thing. Otherwise, that analysis can go. So here, the rest of the, what, what I'm going to talk about is based on the fact that I saved this workspace image. So I save this. It prevents the loss of my data. Um, and then I'm able to open the project folder. Once I'm able to open that, the workspace associated with that particular uh, project folder opens up. So if that uh, project was saved in the middle of an analysis with a particular set of variables loaded into the environment, that environment could get loaded into, that, into your workspace now, right? So you see the other data from this other project loaded into the workspace here. So I do my thing with this project workspace. I run whatever I need to run. Uh, maybe I plot something, I save all of that. And then once my work is done, I go and try to close this project. When I do that, I'm now again prompted by R, reminded that now you have all of these different variables saved into your workspace. 
And so our studio asks me whether I want to save this workspace image. And this workspace image belongs to this particular project. So it's not shared, it's not saved. It doesn't overwrite the workspace image that you've stored earlier, but it's stored in a separate thing in this particular project. Um, so that the next time that you open this project, this you, you can again pick it up from this point, right? And once I do that, my original workspace that I was working before is loaded back. So I don't lose anything. And it maintains continuity across variety, a variety of projects. So I can maintain that continuity across different projects instead of having to load and re reload stuff. However, again, you have to be careful then not to run this other script that you were running before from the beginning, but like track it from at what, what step you might have stopped um, so that you don't make, make these mistakes. And especially when you are using this for final analysis that you're using in a publication, in a paper maybe, I would suggest clearing everything in the workspace explicitly, making sure that you don't need anything from the workspace, clearing it after that, and running the script um, in an empty workspace. That is the only way for you to make sure that the results that you're running um, do not have interference from any variables that might already be loaded in your workspace. Right. So before I go ahead, um, I'll go back to the here uh, section and explain what it does. So the here package, it's, it can be loaded as a library and then it has a command called here. What you do is you take a variable and you assign it the output of this here command. The output of this here command points to this directory in which uh, this project file is saved. So it'll give me this particular path, right? So with this statement, root folder path, I am saving this file path into this. And then in later on, I can use this particular variable to access whatever files are in that folder. Right, so if I want to open my data file, what I will do is I will say read dot um, dlim, which is the way that you can open uh, tab delimited files. Um, and then use this data path, add all data.txt after it, and then you have that variable. I don't have to explicitly mention this file path. And that means that it doesn't matter where that project folder is saved on your, on your computer or on somebody else's computer. It'll always point to wherever that is stored. It doesn't need, so it's dynamic. It doesn't need to be explicitly changed by whoever's running the script every time that it's, it's run. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure who asked uh, it. Yeah, no, I did. Thank you. Okay. So this is one of the most effective things that you can do uh, to improve uh, shareability. It, it does a little bit for readability as well, but really it's the shareability and um, kind of safety of what your results are that it, it really benefits. Okay, then the next thing is about code formatting and how, how your code looks when you read it. So I'll start with the top, we'll start with code headers. Code headers are what go, as the name suggests, at the head or the top of your code. So here you're writing a description of um, what your code is about, who's the author of the code, when is it being written, for what project is it going to be used? Oh, you guys, did you guys lose me for a minute there? No? Okay. Okay, it's all good. Right. So you see. So you mentioned the date that you're starting the code. This is the date that you started the code, the author name, the file name, a description of what that code is meant to do and the project for which that code is going to be used. 
right? This is useful for identifying the purpose of your script so that if the script is shared with somebody, they don't have to wonder what the script is doing. You have described it to them. Um, and I think everything that I say about sharing it with somebody else applies to your future self as well. Four years later, you go back, then the file name that you gave a piece of code will not be informative anymore. You will need to talk to your older self to understand what, what went on in that code. And that description will come in very handy. And I would suggest actually revising that description. Sorry. I suggest revising that description after you're, you've finished coding a piece of code. Because it, it can happen sometimes that you start off with a particular idea for a piece of code. And by the end of it, you realize you know, that it's gotten bigger and it's transformed into something bigger. So I would suggest at the end, when you're saving the final version, that you revise this description here. There are other kinds of revisions that you will do, and we'll, we'll talk about those later. Um, so for code headers, but also for other sections of the code, something that's very useful in our studio is code folding. I'm not sure how many of you know of this feature, but it's very simple. Basically, whenever you write a comment, which starts with a hash, you can have four hashes, hyphens, or equal signs at the end. And once you do that, you get this tiny downward arrow over here. You can click on that arrow and all of the rest until the next code folding line would disappear so that you can scroll through different sections of the code really fast without having to scroll through all of the lines that are, built, that are under each section, right? So it splits up your code um, into chunks that you can minimize and um, kind of take out of your bay. These features come in very useful for as section headers to demarcate different parts of your code that do different things. So as you see here, um, you see that first of all, I have a script header, then I'm making library declarations, then I'm doing data parameters, then I'm uh, programming exclusion parameters, then I am under like I'm, I'm doing some processing of my data, adjusting it in different ways, a different way of adjusting my data, then I'm proceeding in the, uh, with the main analysis, plotting my results and so on. And you see that all of these, I, I don't know what's happening here. Maybe there was no main analysis programmed yet. I think there was no main analysis programmed yet, but all of these are now minimized. So there's a bunch of code, as you see here, maximized under data adjustment. There's a bunch of code here, but when you when you have it all minimized, it's really easy, clean, um, and you can quickly go from one section to another without having to scroll through hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, right? So section, uh, so uh, code folding features can come in very handy to split up your code like that and use section headers. And section headers are extremely nice to be able to provide you context with what, what's happening between relatively independent blocks of code. And each time you give that a heading, you attach a purpose to what's coming afterwards. And once that purpose is attained, you can move on to the next thing that you want to do with your data, right? And you can make it as granular, as minute as you like, um, or not. So the main analysis can be split up into multiple parts. Plotting can be split up into multiple parts and so on and so on. What another, another beautiful feature here is as soon as you split up something into section headers, not only can you see it aligned like that and uh, scroll through that, but R shows it in many different ways. So you have this little hashtag yellow hashtag at the bottom um, of your uh, scripting window. If you click there, you will actually see all of these section headers listed out neatly. So you don't even have to scroll through your code. You can actually scroll through here, go to the section that you want to do um, and get there. Our, uh, our studio would navigate you to that particular section. Right? 
Similarly, you see it also on the right-hand side of the scripting section of the scripting window. Um, and um, while I progress to the next thing, you can actually see, try, try it out um, if you have R Studio open on the side and ask any questions if, you, um, if you're not able to um, get it done. What I like to do is also end each of these section headers with a line like this. But in order to make sure that this also doesn't become section header itself, I include not four, but three hashes at the end. So that there's a sort of uniformity. So I know that this, it starts, this section starts here, it ends here. It kind of provides that boundary. At the same time, this line doesn't become a section header itself if I include only three hashes at the end and not four. So this is not something that you need to do, but it makes your code look neater. Okay, so now, so this was purely a formatting thing. And now we'll move on to um, more sort of gritty areas. So about library declarations. I often see that people use library declarations right before they've used um, they've used a function belonging to a particular package, right? So here a join function which comes from the plier package is being used, and people use the library de like declaration right before using that function. And I don't understand why people do that. I feel like they think that they might forget that this function belongs to this package and they need to make sure that they remember so that if they delete this line, they are sure to delete this library declaration as well. I mean, I think that's a, that's, that's a reasonable motivation to use that. Um, however, it makes the code, it break up, breaks up the code in different ways and it makes it not only um, less readable, but also less usable. Um, and I'll, sh I, I, I'll explain why. Um, Packages are basic requirements. So let's say that I was given this piece of script by somebody and I'm running that particular script and I don't have the plier package installed on my R Studio, right? I run the script until that point and I come to this and the script throws an error because it can't, cannot load a plier library because I don't have it installed on my computer. So it's better that I know that before I ran the previous portion of the code because the previous portion of the code might have taken a couple of hours to run, right? So only after two hours do I come to know, oh, I will actually not be able to successfully run this piece of code because the library function um, is embedded in between. So I suggest that ha having all of the library declarations at the top in a separate section so that that's the first thing that your script runs. So if there's anything that you need to load, any dependencies that you need to take care of, for those packages to get installed. You can do that in the beginning before running any piece of code. So the rest of the code runs smoothly um, and doesn't throw you any surprising errors. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So this is a better way of doing it or have, of having library functions at the top before anything starts altogether. Also a very good way of doing it. However, the best way of doing it is also embedding it um, within a section header, right? And sometimes if you don't know whether a package is installed or not, you can actually use a command like that to check if this package is not installed to install that package. Um, you don't need to do that for every package. I think it's safe if you have library dec declarations at the top and the person that you're sharing your code with is even mildly literate in R, they would know what to do with it. Um, but in a pinch, you could also just include this kind of a statement in the beginning. Of course, we come to this point where if I wasn't using that join function earlier, that library declaration would stay on among my other library declarations at the top and be unnecessary. It would take unnecessary, it would, you know, the, the amount of time that that library function 
would take to load would be completely unnecessary to the processing of your code. So what I suggest is after you're done programming a code, before you want to share it, delete your library functions one at a time and try to see if something goes wrong. Another thing that you can do instead is to here have plier colon join. So that when you remove something that has ply that has plier in it, so that when you remove the let's say library declaration for plier, your code will throw an error because it will not be able to find the plier library loaded. Right. So if you're just loading a library for one command, make sure that you include the library name here when you run this command. And I'm not sure if people understand what I mean here. If you don't, again, please interrupt me. Okay, so I, I see that people are uh, shaking their heads no. Uh, let me go back to the here package example. So this thing is an example of what I was talking about and it's confusing because here the library name and the function name is the same, but this first here refers to the library package. And the second here refers to the function in the library package. So you can actually have a double colon like that. And that says that I want R to pick up the here function from the here package. So if you did that in the other thing that we were seeing now, um, here, so I would have plier, P-L-Y-R, double colon join so that it is it is a message for me that join comes from plier library function so if i remove join i can think about lib removing plier as a library declaration if it's not found anywhere else in the code but it's also useful for programs uh, for like scripts because sometimes the same function uh, name can exist in two different packages and if you're using both packages in your library declarations, then the script kind of by default chooses which package it picks that function from, and you might want the other package. So it's also good to specify the library name along with the double colon. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, this is another example of that. So remotes, is the is the package name and install github um, is the function that is being loaded there okay so now we come to version control this is a quite a big topic um by okay i can't have a show of hands maybe um, people can unmute themselves if they have if they use a a sort of a version control. Yes, me. Yes, yes, I do. Yes. Okay. So, what kinds of version controls do you guys use? Git. GitHub. <laughs> GitHub. Okay. Yeah. Others. Any other forms of version controls? Is Bitbucket um, a version control, Julia? No, it's a Git. It's or, a Git. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Any others? No. So I am pretty sure that all of you use version control. You just don't know that you use version control. So just changing your file names and adding underscore final at the end is also a form of version <laughs> control. You're kind of demarcating yourself that this, this file is the next version of this previous file, right? That's a very rudimentary sort of version control. Um, and that is a perfectly acceptable way of actually versioning your files. Um, if, I mean, Git is an advanced thing to use and it can be quite complicated and can lead to errors. And sometimes all you need is a simple changing of the file name. So it's perfectly acceptable, um, but you need to make sure that you're choosing the correct way for what makes sense in your particular situation. And that's why we need to have this coming up section. So version control is critical in industry. It's like absolutely, absolutely necessary. 
and almost nobody practices it in a formal way in academia, right? Unless, unless somebody develops a software that is being deployed outside their group, you know, making packages for R, people do not use version control. Um, however, it can be very useful for the development of your analysis because often you analyze something and you get unexpected results. And then you want to do a follow-up analysis. So you keep adding to your code, right? And then you meet with your supervisors and they come up with this other idea. And then you do another analysis. Or then you do the same analysis in a different way. Or you plot results in multiple different ways. And so your code kind of goes through multiple changes from first theorizing your study to publishing it. And so it's, it's very useful to have a formal way that you use version control that is consistent throughout the length of your project. Right? It is, it is really fancy to use Git, but if you forget to commit um, every time you make a new version of your code, it's completely useless, right? And then it might just be better to have to, to, to change the name of your file. So all of these things are really important. And so you, you need to understand the pitfalls associated with each, the advantages and disadvantages and make the best choice for yourself. So as I mentioned, there are several ways of practicing version control. There's version control softwares like Git and SVN. Um, you can use separate file names, but also you can actually make changes within a particular script. You don't even need to change file names. You can actually make changes within a particular script, keep saving it to the same file name to do version control. And believe it or not, the third way is the way that we used to do version control when I worked in Accenture as a software developer. So we didn't have a version control software that our team used. We actually used within code change logs. And I'll show you what that means in a bit. So first of all, using version control software like Git or SVN, um, it's, a, it's a fairly common way these days and it's creeping into academia also. Everybody seems to have a GitLab or a GitHub account. Um, in my own university, um, our university has a tie up with GitLab and through our university accounts, we can use it. Um, and I prefer GitLab to GitHub because you can have private repositories without paying, um, which is not the case in GitHub. In GitHub, if you pay, you can get a private repository, otherwise your repository is public. Um, so I prefer Git GitLab for that reason. Um, however, these are, this is an example of a GitHub repository. Um, by someone I know. And so you see that all of their packages are, um, are free for somebody to see and also to like monitor progress on, um, to see how that package is developing, to see the history of that package. It's all free for everybody to see. And it's, it really leads to um, transparency in the whole coding um, and analysis development process, which I really appreciate. So the advantages here, are that all of the code history that has ever, ever occurred, every little change that you've made, um, every little thing that you've deleted is all saved and you can instantly revert to any version that you, um, that you want to, right? So if you then made, um, if there was a working version of your code um, a month back, and now your code doesn't seem to be doing what you want it to be doing, you can just revert to that, to that version instead of trying to figure out what went wrong. So that's very easy. You can also branch your project and try a different analysis. So you can have two different versions of your same project running different kinds of analysis and see which one is better. Um, and you can choose the level of technicality that you can work with. So you can actually function minimally with very basic commands all you need is push, pull, commit, and you are good. Um, or you can use forking and branching and all of these other things and get really technical and really complicated. So there's a wide range of um, usage styles available when you use something like Git. Another advantage is that it syncs across devices. So you can do stuff on your personal computer and it'll still load. Um, whatever latest changes you made on your personal computer at your work computer. And this also makes it great for collaboration because the changes can be shared with the team member instantly. Right? You can instantly reflect whatever changes you're making just by running in our git commit. Um, so it's, it's very fast that way. 
The disadvantages, however, is that it requires some bit of initial investment of time and effort that goes into understanding it and setting it up, and also in getting into the practice of remembering to push and commit your changes, which I must admit, I keep forgetting. So um, I'm not very good at this. It is also useless, all of these commits, unless you have a good informative change message. And this cannot be emphasized enough. Because if you say changes made to the analysis, and you say that for every time you change your analysis, you are not really sure which version you want to revert to when you want to revert to a particular version. Right, so having all of that code history means nothing if then you are still sitting there and trying to compare different versions of your code and seeing oh, which line was different, then you might have as well saved it in different files saying final, final, final. So the informative change messages, commit messages are really what makes it useful. Another disadvantage is that it's an ever expanding repository. It doesn't matter whether you delete something a version of that is being shared, uh, is, is being saved to your repository. So the size of the repository is always growing. And that means server space is always growing. And server space is one of the biggest, uh, it's, it's going to be one of the biggest problems with climate change now because everything is on a server and it's heating up the environment. So another way of doing version control is, as I mentioned, separate file names. Um, I suggest instead of doing final, final, to save it by date, right? Having date at the beginning means that your scripts are, would, can be sorted very easily according to the date that you changed it. And so you always know what is the latest version of your code and what comes before it. So you know your, your uh, changes are chronologically organized. And so if you remember, if you note in, in, in your logbook, that the version from uh, the 9th of June was working, but the version of the 11th of June doesn't work, then you can just simply go to that file and run that instead, right? Or you can open both of these in a program that, uh, that can help you to compare code and you can compare lines and see what you've changed. And that'll make it easy to identify the bug that you are dealing with. If you do make separate file names like that, it is also important to change the script header log. Um, and we'll come to the change log in the next thing, but separate file names are more useful if you also have a change log embedded in your code. So it can be used in combination with the next way of version control that I'm talking about. Once you've finalized your scripting, you can delete your previous versions of code if you think that that version history is not important to you, right? So your repository is not forever expanding. So the advantage is here that you have no learning curve. You can start doing it straight away. Everybody knows how to save a file and, change and, and save a file with a new name. You maintain a history of previous changes if you keep the previous files from previous dates. It's easy to revert to a previous version by simply clicking a previous file and opening that. However, there's no code syncing unless you employ a syncing method um, otherwise. So you might have a shared folder, you might have a OneDrive, you might have a Dropbox that you're sharing with somebody um, and you can implement syncing and sharing changes with somebody else that way. Right, so you can still do that even though there's no explicit code syncing. The disadvantage is that this is not good for collaboration, although you can actually make it work really well if you have Dropbox or something like that. It is hard to see which version it has what changes from the top of it, because the top only has your file name. It doesn't have a, a, like a descriptive change message like Git would have. So just by looking at your file names, you don't, wouldn't know what changes you've made. You'd have to open your files and see uh, maybe the change log to be able to see the changes. Um, and so, yeah, there's this detailed thing, but basically it's, it's, what it, it's what I've said. The disk storage size can keep on increasing with every new file. It can actually more than double with every new file, right? Because every file 
probably has what you had in the previous version and then some more lines of code. Um, so at least until the end, when you delete older versions, your disk space uh, keeps on growing with every new file. You need to, it is important to remember to include the change in the header, the, uh, the code header that I showed you earlier. Otherwise, it's hard to see if you made any change or what change you made between two versions um, of a particular code. It is tedious to compare changes across versions unless you use something like Notepad++, let's say, where it kind of clearly demarcates this is the line that was changed from one code to another. And accidental saves of an old file with the new changes, but with the old file name are likely to happen. So what I would suggest in that case is when you open an old file, before you do anything to the file itself, first file, save as, save it as today's date, and only then start making the changes. Okay, so now the third method of version control, which is within code change. So you, the file name remains the same, but what you do is you include a change log. This is a change log before your script, sorry, below your script header. So you mention the date on which you're making the changes, who's making the changes, what is the change being made? So the technical change that you're making to your code and what is the purpose of that change, right? And then you demarcate that particular change in your code like so. So you say start of change, you mention the date, the author, and if you see the difference here is in these signs. So I had a less than sign and a greater than sign. I've converted it to the other way around, greater than to less than. But instead of just making the change in the signs, I comment that line and I repeat that line and then make the change there. So now when I see this, it becomes clear, okay, well, I changed this to this. So this was how it was earlier. Now I want it like that, right? So this is kind of a manual way of implementing what Git does, right? And you're demarcating it clearly using these comment lines because of which it's very easy to spot what your changes are. Um, if it so happens that you make two different changes, on the same day with a different purpose, you can actually have an additional thing here, call it change number. And you can include that change number in the comment here so that you can, you can understand, okay, this change was made for this particular purpose while this other change was made for this other purpose. So it makes it very easy to track. Here, you don't even need to change the file names but you can also use this technique in combination with using different file names for every change. The advantage of using it in combination with using different file names is that it makes it easier for you to go back to a previous version. You don't have to then go through deleting all of, all of, all of this again or reverting it, sorry, or reverting it, right? Uncommenting it, um, deleting this, removing all this, that becomes easier if you use it in combination with different file names. So the advantages here are that there's no initial investment of time and effort needed to set up this method. Um, there are no multiple files needed, doesn't require anything outside of your code to maintain the versions. There are no conflicts with other files. Um, you see all of the changes and versions in the same file and you see why those changes were done. So the change messages, the informative change messages are also included. It is easy to see what changes happened when. Um, and commented out pieces of old code can be deleted once the code is finalized. So once you know that I'm not going to make any more changes to the, to the script, and I also don't care about what change I made when and why, I can actually go back, delete this, delete the change log remove that change log. So the file size also then considerably reduces and then it also makes the code neater, cleaner, um, more readable. 
The disadvantages is that this is not an elegant, uh, elegant solution. It's quite obsolete. And uh, people with more software experience can resist change logs, although I think it's, it's really great because it requires no dependence on technology. You can do it yourself. Um, it is difficult to share changes to your code with other people, but that can be solved with cloud um, or uh, universities have their own service. So if you're using kind of shared folders with you know, part of your team, that's easy. And it falls midway between the other two options, Git or different file names for ease and collaboration and understanding um, of what's going on when. Okay, so now that we've talked so much about change logs and informative change messages, it's a good point of time to come to commenting. Um, appropriate and thorough com com commenting in code is imperative. Um, it, is, it is one of the, I think, easiest things to do. And yet it is also one of the easiest things to get wrong because there's just like, what, what is the language that you need to be um, using when you're commenting makes a huge difference to how easy it is to understand a line of code. So first of all, commenting helps with readability, sharing, so others can understand and verify steps easily. It helps you with revisiting your code, past code, um, even after years. And it helps with making changes and adjustments to the code. Advice on commenting ranges from you should comment every line to comment as less as possible while maintaining readability. Um, and so I don't think that there's a right answer here. However, I do think that the comments should establish a balance between under and over explaining. Because when you're over explaining, you might be too verbose using too many words and that makes your code cluttered. But when you're under explaining, it really loses its value, commenting loses its value because it makes it harder for people that you share with to understand, it makes it harder for your future self to understand your code. With comments, it is generally recommended to answer the question, why the next line, rather than what is the next line. Right, so if you have the next line saying x equals x plus two, and above that you are commenting adding two to x, that is not a helpful comment. You need to say why that two is needs to be added to x at that point of time. Right, because maybe however x is a time variable, um, whatever time uh, a stimulus delay was. And then you add two seconds for giving an additional delay to a particular participant group. So you need to mention that purpose above that code because you're coming from the assumption that people, people who are reading your code understand um, the programming syntax. So they know what adding two to X looks like. What they need to understand is why you're doing it, right? So it should be helpful beyond what the code is already telling you. It should not be redundant in terms of, well, if they read the code, they would see that X2 is being added to X. So it should be helpful beyond what the code is telling you. Otherwise it is just clutter, useless. Also don't leave all of the heavy lifting to comments. A lot of times the way you name uh, your variables and your functions can convey what's happening with those variables or within those functions. So you don't, so then you don't have to rely too much on comments before function declarations, sorry. So what not to do? Open file. If anybody knows basic R, they know that read table opens a file. So I don't need to say that I'm opening a file here. I can already see that I'm opening a file here. Um, other things, add subject number. Here, this variable tells you that this, this subject number is being retrieved, right? And that the subject number is then being added to the data frame temp. So comments should be helpful beyond what the code is clearly saying. 
and you should define the purpose why you're doing that. So uh, what I've done here is converted this piece of code to something else um, that has better commenting. And you can see I've also not only changed, like reduced the number of comments, but I've changed the variable names so that I don't need those comments. So first of all, instead of saying import coding results, because what does that mean, import coding results? What coding results? What are this? I'm specifying, well, I'm retrieving data subject-wise, right? So I'm looping through all of the subjects in, from all of my files, right? So all file names will get all of my files. And I'm looping through all of the subjects in these oil file names. Then I get the particular accuracy file for a particular subject. So I call that subject accuracy file. And then I do stuff with it. And here it's not clear why, why I'm combining it. Uh, it's not clear why I need to do this conversion. So I basically, instead of commenting on every line, I make kind of a block of code separated by white spaces from stuff that came before it that did not need commenting. And then I make, make a very informative comment here that what I'm doing is I'm including this subject number in the data frame before combining it with other subject data. Right, so I detail out the process rather than say on every line that I'm opening this file and I'm combining with other files. I'm saying this needs to be done before that. Then I'm also, if you see these, because they have four hyphens at the end would serve as um, section headers. So I am, instead of making a simple code, also defining section headers informatively that tell you what's happening in that section of code, right? That is also a part of commenting. So subject-wise data retrieval and then onset and offset time data retrieval. And then if you see here, you see all file names and you see plat file names. Whatever does that mean, Prat file names? To somebody who's reading the code, they don't know what the, what the significance of having Prat file names. I don't know if any of you are linguists, Prat files. So all I know is that some file names are being retrieved from Prat, or they were processed by Prat by some reason. But what those files are, I don't have that information here. So when I change that variable name to onset offset file names, I know that those files give me details about the onset or and offset of particular sounds. And if you are a linguist, you wouldn't understand what onset and offset is, right? So you don't, you don't need any more information there. And then again, all of this subject onset offset data, I know that in the this file instead of calling it temp because well do we know what temp is it just means that I right but here when I call it subject on um, subject onset offset data I know what information exactly is going into that variable and I don't need to specify it above right so I actually have more information than I had with this extremely specific comment by not having a comment and having proper variable names. Another example of what not to do. So this is literally kind of almost commenting on every line, but it's not really clear. Number of trees per site. And then the summary statement. Um, I'm not sure. It, I mean, I kind of understand that this statement is likely to output the number of trees per site. Okay, but then what, Then it says dominant species and then a unique statement. And now I'm not sure what it means by dominant species, right? I can kind of guess that it might be that I will see all of the names of dominant species from this particular data metadata frame. It's probably like that. But this, co this comment can be more informative. Um, then select sites dominated by coniferous species. 
while there is a select state, while there is a select variable. So first of all, it's weird to use select as a variable name because it's a verb, right? And select is often actually a function name in packet switches. So it's not advisable to use that as a variable name. Then other examples, um, you have something like change all the code from my errors to one, and then a bunch of variable names and a bunch of statements where you don't understand where the, where the, what the errors were, what the error codes were and where they are being changed to one. So it's quite confusing. And if you spend some time on it, I'm sure that you can understand it, but that's the problem that you will need to spend some time on it. And it doesn't immediately show you whether this is happening. You know, this is what's happening after this. So there are, these are some examples of good commenting practices from the internet. Now these are not examples from R, so the syntax can, can look confusing. So this don't return thing is the comment. And instead of saying, we are returning this value, this is an informative comment for whoever will be looking at that code later, that set add itself should not be returned because it is not chainable in IE. So that when somebody comes to change the piece of code, they don't make the mis mistake of returning set.add instead of returning the whole of the object set. Because set.add is whatever is chainable. I don't know what chainable is, but I now know if I was going to change this code that I should not say return set.add, right? So it's a very informative piece of information that the code is not already giving you. Then here, don't use the global is finite because it returns true for null values. So what is different about these commenting statements than the ones that we've seen before is that one, they give information that is different from the, what, the, what, what the code is telling you. And two, they are not actually describing what the code is being used for. They're describing something entirely different. They are kind of um, already predicting what another coder might think of, might do, right? Or also informing another coder, well, I've already tried this. This doesn't work because of this reason, so don't do that, right? And these kinds of comments might not be use useful for people who are working individually on code names, but it can be used as like useful um, reminders for your future self. Well, I had to multiply it by two here for this particular reason, right? So don't think of removing that too because of this reason. So it's, it's kind of this kind of communication that you can have for your future self. Then I've been talking a lot about how to name variables. Um, so we come to naming conventions. Things to avoid here is having inconsistency in how you name variables and functions within a piece of code and across different pieces of code. Names that do not reveal the exact purpose of that variable, function, or file are useless. And you should not use cryptic abbreviations as names because those abbreviations might be things that you have come up in the moment, but your future self or somebody else might not be able to understand what that means. Right, so um, examples here, file equal to list files. I can very easily here add something before file and say, what kind of files am I listing? What kind of data that is? Instead of just saying something generic as file, calling something generic um, as meta, Right. What meta, okay, this is this must be metadata, but what kind of metadata is, is it? What does it refer to? If I already make that variable name informative, I actually wouldn't need comments. Or, um, then this is a slightly better way of naming. Um, ex, like all file names at least is more informative than just file names. We know that here we are pulling up all of the files in a particular directory, but then subject number is really good, but then temp is not good or file name is not good. 
a Pratt data is not good. And then there's temp again with a with a different thing loaded into it this time. So all of this is not really useful. Single letter file names. Uh, sorry, single letter variable names. Really bad because with A or D or B, you don't really understand. So unless that single letter means something by itself, like G is acceleration due to gravity. And then if you're using your code for something related to gravity and you have G as a variable name, that's, you know, that's fine, right? But those are very specific things. Um, and those would likely be a constant that you would actually not be processing anyway. So I would actually completely say never use single letter file names, right? Or P for P value, instead of saying P, call it P value. Even, um, even these file names, which are not single letter, but that are, that have some kind of an abbreviation going on, VG, NWR, I would discourage that unless it's an abbreviation that's common. You know, everybody knows it. If I have fMRI data, that's fine because everybody knows fMRI, right? That's completely fine, but I don't know what NWR is. I don't know what VG is. And actually this is, um, this is uh, data from my own field and I still don't understand it, right? Sorry, there was um, a good question. Um, when you generate, when you want to generalize this, uh, your code, for example, when you want to share it uh, as a reprex, um, wouldn't it be better to use some general names, like for example, data frame, frame one, or instead of uh, uh, like Carlos has exemplified here, penguins data frame, <laughs> for example. Okay, so it when, when you mean you want to share your code with people, do you mean that you want to share how a particular thing is done um, for the purpose of like, let's say Stack Exchange. If you're posting on Stack Exchange, it's a different thing. Um, but if you're sharing your file with some other scientist who, you know, like if you're loading it up on the open science framework, um, because reviewers might want to look through your code, then I would really suggest using, you know, a penguin data frame variable name rather than data frame one, because that will exactly tell them what they're going through. Right. So if sharing is for, um, exchanging a tech a coding technique of course a diff, you know a different thing can also work while even in that case i don't i don't see why penguin's data frame would be a bad thing would be a bad name right i think it's still more it's like i think number sequences are harder to remember harder to track in your working memory across different point times than having pen penguin data frame versus Conifers tree species data frame, right? It's easier for you to track in your working memory because you have a visual attached to penguins and you have a visual attached to conifers trees rather than just numbers. So I think that having kind of meaningful names like that is just helpful anyway, rather than having sequences. But yeah, good question. Thanks. Um, then here. It's much more informative than the previous one. So we see misses, hits, false alarms. You see current sub and you see current sub two. What's happening there? Um, and then there's also this kind of cluttery feeling that you get from this code because the variables are all named in different ways. So P number has P uh, in lowercase um, and N in uppercase, but current file has C and F in both lowercases. So there is this lack of uniformity and consistency in the formatting of the names and not in naming itself, but in the formatting of these names. Or there are some other uh, variables that begin with a capital letter and then continue on with a small letter. 
So there's a consistency that you should be going on here. And if you have that consistency, it'll be much easier for you to read your code. So um, as I mentioned, naming conventions are very important for readability, reusability, and modularity. However, the, in the context of R, there are no consistent naming convention suggestions available. So usually programming languages have their own conventions in how a particular thing is done. For R, this is not the case. Um, and there is a very good paper by Rasmus Bach uh, on this particular topic, where he summarizes the different kinds of naming conventions that are suggested by Google um, for R, by um, people developing the core R as well as R packages, and how even in the core R, there are different naming conventions across different packages. There are also varied styles across companies. Um, and all of these advice are actually in contradiction with each other. So Google's advice radically differs from advice given by those designing internal packages for R, right? So there is a lot of variability. And so I think it's important for us as individuals or maybe as labs to define what R naming conventions are going to be and use those consistently across um, not only, so not only within a code, but across different pieces of code. So naming conventions um, can be decided according to what case you're going to use. So either you can have all lowercase, everything's in lowercase, or you have lower camel case. So this is called camel case because there's a hump every now and then with a capital letter. So it's lower camel cases. The first word starts with a lower case but every subsequent word starts with a capital, capital letter. Or there's upper, upper camel, uh, camel case where all of the words start with a capital letter. You can have separate of, um, based uh, distinctions. So you can always have a period separating different words. So here different words are determined by the capitalization. Here different words are being determined by the period that's separating them or the underscore that's separating them. Variables, like always try to make your variables be nouns. It's not difficult. Subject number, mean RT plot, all data file path, instead of having something like select, which is a verb. Why? Because functions should be verbs. Because functions perform an action while variables are storing some content. So they are nouns. There's the name of the content that is being stored, while functions should be named after the verbs, the actions that those functions perform, right? So retrieve data and not data retriever. Data retriever would be the noun there. Calculate Fourier transform and not Fourier transform calculator. Names should also be self-explanatory. You shouldn't have to comment above a variable to say what that variable stands for. You can do that if you want to explain the purpose of um, whatever value that variable has to the rest of your code. That's fine, that's acceptable, but not directly to explain the variable name itself. There should be a balance between explaining and being concise. So this applies to commenting and this applies to naming con conventions. And this balance can actually be helped by having modularity in your code. And what modularity means is that you split up different portions of your code and maybe a practice that you're, a particular action that is being repeated on different, um, different pieces of your code can maybe include it as a function. And then you call that function and over, over and over again. So you make modules in your code and that's how you, um, that's how you don't have to re keep repeating the same code in different places. Right. It is possible to choose also a different style of naming depending on the um, purpose that a particular name serves. So it could, you could choose to have variables in lower camel case while having functions being period separated and file names being underscore separated. My suggestion is to not have file names be period separated because periods often determine are often used to specify the extension of file names. 
and it can be confusing across different, uh, depending on the OS that you're in, to have periods or spaces um, in the file names. And lower camel case as file names becomes a bit harder to read. So I really suggest going with underscore separated file names. And for variables and functions, you can choose the same thing or choose it differently so that you don't have to read something and understand, oh, this is a verb, so it must be a function, but you can see it very immediately. Oh, this has period in it, must be a function. This is lower camel case, must be a variable name. Right, so it becomes also very easy to distinguish because otherwise sometimes it, it can get really confusing. If something is being retrieved here through this function name or if something is being stored here through this variable name, it becomes really confusing to understand that. Make your choice according to what your purpose of coding is. Are you coding individually or in a team you, that you need to share your code with? Are you coding for an individual project or are you developing an R extension or package? Coding individually for an individual project means that you need to be consistent, but you can choose freely, right? But even though you choose freely, you try to maintain that choice across different projects and different time points in your coding practice. If you're coding individually for a package or extension, your choice should be driven by the conventions in existing packages in that particular field. So that the whatever piece of code you're reading reads uniformly to somebody else who also designs packages in that field. And the, the paper that I mentioned earlier is a good source for this. Um, he does this analysis where he tries to see the different naming conventions used and then he recommends to choose the most common naming convention used, but his paper is from 2012 and it's nine years later and things might have changed in the meanwhile. So you can conduct your own analysis like that, like he does in the paper. If you're coding in a team, your choice should be driven by what everyone is comfortable with, the co a compromise that you can achieve with your teammates and what everybody can find easy to maintain across the length of that particular project. Um, so, as I mentioned before, R is quite a recent language and data types of variables are transformable, right? So if you, um, if you have a variable that is an integer, you can change it into a factor very easily. However, in other languages and softwares, Java, C++, data types are not changeable. If it's a float variable, it remains a float variable. And so oftentimes, um, Actually, I'm, maybe I shouldn't say often. Usually it's the case that the, uh, the name of a particular variable also, uh, also shows what data type is that variable. So you have something like IV subject number. Here the I shows that this is an integer. The V shows it's a variable because some programming languages also make distinctions between having variables and constants. The value of constants don't change over the, uh, the particular script. So IV is an integer variable. SC is a string constant, right? So when I, when I used to code, we had to prefix our variable names with something like this so that anybody who's then going to use that code knows that it can only capture integer values. And if something is being divided by two, for instance, that it needs to be an even number. Otherwise the script will throw an error because it will become a point something. And be careful to make de declarations. So for, again, this is not for R, but in other languages, usually you need a section in the beginning to make all your variable declarations that you're going to use later in the code in R declarations are not needed before something is being used. So it's perfectly fine to ignore this. Now, you see what happens when we implement all of this advice. So I have changed this piece of code. We saw this earlier with current sub, current sub two, D prime, V number, current file. And I've changed it and applied the stuff that we used until now. So what I've done is kind of having a uniform lower case, uh, lower camel case, for all of the variables, except um, D prime. I seem to have missed to change that. I think I just applied it here. Um, I've applied section headers. Um, and I think it's, it continues next. So first we'll go through what, what we have here. So defines subject number, current file. And instead of having 
um, so I think current sub was correct responses to condition one. And so I in, instead have correct condition one. It very clearly tells me, this is from condition one, these are the correct responses. From condition one, these are the incorrect responses. And coupled with what comes afterwards, very clearly that I'm subsetting my data frame, which is current file by condition number. And what you see what I'm doing, I'm also, I don't have all of this blue here anymore. These are hard coded values, right? Hard coding is not good. Instead I have condition one and at the top, I probably defined condition one as integer value one. Um, and correct response again is coded as one here. I've decided probably defined this at the top as correct response equals one and incorrect response equals zero or two or whatever. So in that case, if in your data file, you change the meaning, like what is an incorrect response coded as, is it coded as a zero or a two? You only have to make that change in, in the beginning. You don't have to trace your file looking for like, where else do I have to make this change to make sure that my code runs properly? You only have to change it in one place because you've not hard coded these numbers. You've declared them as constants in the beginning of your file. And these I, I call parameters. So apart from your library declarations, you have parameter declarations. And these parameters are not going to change through the length of your code. And you use these parameters they make your code more readable and less susceptible to bugs. And also more flexible because as I said, like if your data file changes, your kind of coding changes on your data, you only have to make that change in one place. So you can very quickly then um, run the code for a different kind of data file. Also, instead of having misses and hits because I'm not really sure what these values represent, I say that these are the ratio of misses. This is the ratio of hits. Um, and on the next, I say ratio of false alarms, ratio of correct rejects. All of this was there, but all of this kind of naming makes it so much clearer. Also here, this I was being used as the index to retrieve information, uh, to retrieve D prime information about about all of these ratios. I clearly said, mentioned here that this is file index because I is very unclear what I means here, right? And this is the file index that we were looping through. Um, with, when it comes to file naming conventions, uh, as I mentioned before, avoid special characters or spaces in file names, stick to letters, numbers, and underscores. So this is a good example. These are bad examples. Try to have full words. Um, and this example comes from a style guide by the tidyverse package. So I think this is also a good resource to understand more of these kinds of recommendations of what is, um, you know, what can make your code more readable. Um, then I've talked about hard coding. So avoid hard coding instead of having these kinds of things, the numbers directly coded in your code um, have a parameter section on the top. So here I have C dot correct response coded as one, C dot incorrect response coded as two. And this means that I can just directly change it to zero and use it on a different data file. And I would still be okay. I would not have to uh, spend effort in changing many different sections of my code or even trying to find where I should make that change. So if you see what I've done here is I've used two different kinds of um, um, conventions. So I've used, this is the lower camel case and this is the period separated. And what you can do is use these different conventions for different things. So if you're going to have parameters that you don't want should change throughout your file, you can have period separated ones. And then you know that you shouldn't make any adjustments to those parameters. They are never going to be assigned anything because they've been assigned something at the beginning of the file. I've shown you all of these examples. 
shown that. Yeah. Right. Another thing that I've done that has made this code more, re more readable is to break it up with white space. Something as simple as uh, collecting like statements together and then separating that from white space from other like statements make your, makes your code much more readable than before. Right, so none of this, if you take none of this, take the power of white space and change logs with you. I think that can already make such a huge difference. Um, so white spaces can be used by, as I said, grouping stuff that does the same thing together, having a separate comment on it, and then using white space to separate the next thing that is very different from the group of statements that you had before. And finally, we come to modularity. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but um, in very simple terms, modularity can be increased by having your own user-defined functions. So if there are things that you do again and again in the same piece of code, or if there are things that you do throughout your career in different projects, you know, you always have to uh, pick up files from somewhere and uh, collate them into a larger file, right? You can create dedicated functions for them, store them so that you can very easily just copy paste that function somewhere and reuse that in your new code. So user defined functions can be immensely helpful with readability because they allow you to break code chunks that do different things. Right, and they allow you kind of a curtain behind which that code can hide so that it doesn't clutter up uh, your more immediate purpose. Um, it, turns, um, it, it, it turns code into functions rather than sections that you use with code folding. And it provides you with informative names that can make whatever comes behind it easy to understand without the need of including explicit commenting. So that explicit commenting can stay within that function code and doesn't clutter up your main analysis section. Right, and I think this is the end. Oh no, yes, yeah. So it results in simplification, reusability. It makes it much easier to debug. Um, oh yeah, I've actually shown examples here of uh, having user-defined functions so that you have these kind of user-defined functions in one file instead of having it in the file where you are doing all of your main things. And then you use a source function to source that file into your current file, right? So it would effectively be such that these functions are actually declared in your current file, but it doesn't clutter up your current file in the same way. Um, yeah, this is a bonus month function. I'm not sure how many of you know about pipe functions. This is a pipe function. And um, it's, it's a sort of a new way of coding in R, relatively new, um, as opposed to base R, where you assign everything over and over again. So if I had, a, uh, if I wanted to do something on the iris data frame, if I wanted to subset, I would maybe say uh, iris length greater than five and then assign that this subset. Instead of that, what this pipe function does is it's saying take iris and then subset it to length greater than five. And then the result of that aggregated across species by the mean function. Right, so it serves this and then function, but it reduces the number of lines that you're coding and it improves readability. But I'll not go into details here because this is this can take another two hours uh, going into pipe functions. But I would suggest looking into that and there is a tutorial available on the data camp website that you can use for that. Yeah, that was all. All right, any questions? Lovely. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> very, very inspiring and a lot of things to think about now. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know, you know, my script is my script, but my, I'm thinking continually of what I can do to, yeah, have it be open so that I can share it with a colleague if uh, he or she wants to use part of it or, yeah, just not to have to have the next person repeat this process. Right, yeah. Yeah. And also I would recommend, like if you are going to start using these tips, to not have to wait until the end of your project when you have to share it with somebody to make all of these yeah. changes, but incorporate these tips right from the beginning in your workflow itself. So you don't have to spend that effort afterwards in going through that and correcting. And because it might happen that then you discover you've already written your paper and you're uploading your you know code and you're making all of these changes and then discover, oh, this bug because yeah. now your code is more readable, right? So if you yeah. already incorporate it into your process, you will make those discoveries much earlier on and save yourself. Um, a lot of time and anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there are any... not so many questions, but uh, fantastic comments. Uh, if you don't have your chat open, it says amazing tips. Thanks for the great presentation. Wonderful talk. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so... I'm really glad.